so yeah, first of all, thanks all for coming to this talk. Uh, I know there I have some strong competition. I think Jürgen Höller is over the at the auditorium. And um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about cloud platforms today, or like platforms that you can use to deploy your Spring Boot microservices. So this is not really an in-depth talk about Spring Boot or Spring technology. This is more about the deployment and runtime of those components. My name is Matthias. This is, uh, this is my Twitter handle. I'm using this quite actively, so uh, I'm always happy if I get new followers and get inspiration for people to follow. So that's me in two different versions. So the one to the left is the Cloud Foundry ambassador and meetup organizer version. So I am organizing the Cloud Foundry meetup, that user community in the area of um, Stuttgart in Germany. So is there anybody from southern Germany in the room? OK. There's a meetup next week. <laughs> and you're all invited. Uh, for the ones who are close enough, feel free to come by. And um, if I'm not doing things on Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, or other platforms in or for community works, I have a regular day job as a consultant in a company called Novatech, where I try to help clients getting their workloads to the cloud in either like new implementations or migrations and um, advise them on their, on their strategy. So speaking briefly about Novatech, we mostly operate out of Germany and um, we have about 250 to 300 employees. It's mostly around software development, modern software development, agile methodologies, and everything that surrounds that, including, of course, um, the cloud native aspect. So I edit this slide yesterday and try to highlight that we also have a branch in Spain, in Granada. Now, on the keynote this morning, I learned there are more German people than Spanish people in the conference, so I could highlight all the others as well. Um, in general, we're German-based, but the Spanish branch is increasing. So if you have any, uh, if you want any more information about what we're doing and where, we, where we're doing that, um, feel free to ping me afterwards. So now I don't really want to get in too much detail um, about where we are located. So I'm going to give a bit of an intro to kind of frame the talk and um, tell you what I intend to show. So I'm pretty sure most of you have seen kind of a cloud abstraction layer diagram in one or the other form. Um, what I wanted to show with this is just basically uh, what are the various layers where you can put your software, your workload, and um, what, kind, what are the kind of differences. So it started all with virtual machines, then there came containers. Nowadays, functions, or the term serverless, is used very frequently. Um, basically, there's a certain tendency that the, the further you go down in the stack, size of footprint of your workloads and, and the infrastructure increases, you have bigger startup time and tighter coupling and cohesion. The further you go up in the stack, um, there's more abstraction, flexibility, and distribution of your, of your services. Now, I'm not going to talk much about virtual machines and functions today. So I'm going to stick kind of to container and application layer. And in order to, to demonstrate that, how I can deploy and run Spring Boot workloads on those layers, I'm going to use the examples of Cloud Foundry and, and Kubernetes. So speaking of that, I know this is not a platform conference. Um, who in the room is, has ever been been working with Cloud Foundry? So that's a few. Who has been working with Kubernetes? That's a few more. Um, I, yeah, I started talking about that like one and a half years ago or something like that. Then it's, it was quite the opposite way around. Kubernetes was just like in the very beginning, um, but it has a very strong adoption rate and it, it's, it's growing really fast. So um, either way, if, if you're not familiar with, with either one, I'm going to cover all of the basics as well to make sure um, I, I get you all on board. So first, a little disclaimer. If you compare those two platforms, you can also compare on various levels. So what I'm not going to talk about today is pretty much everything 
beneath container level. So it's not like how many VMs do you need to install your cluster and what, uh, what are the, the, like the difference in platform uh, topics. And also, I'm not going to want to go into like vendor-specific implementations. So like Google versus Amazon Kubernetes or PCF versus SAP Cloud Foundry or whatsoever. I really want to stick to like the open source core and just show how those, how those platforms behave and when you, what you basically can expect from them. So yeah, this is what I want to talk about. So right here, this is like my Mrs. or Mr. Developer with a certain kind of an application. I can do this normally in a generic way. Today, it will, of course, be like a Spring Boot application. And then all the things that you face if you want to run this on, on, a, on a cloud platform. So the first step, basically, how easy is it to get it deployed? What are the steps for me necessary to take to get the application running there? How simple is that? Then once it's running, um, what happens if an application crashes? Uh, how quickly or how does the platform recover that? And what do I need to do in order to, to, to make the platform doing so? Then scaling is one of the big things in, in cloud technologies. So how easily can I scale? And um, what, um, how does the platform help me with this? Logging is, of course, very important from a developer perspective. So once, once something goes wrong, how can I get an insight of what my application does? And um, service bindings, meaning in a way that normally I don't just push an application code. We just had a session in here for Neo4j. There are several other services, like backend services for messaging and databases that you can attach to. So how easy or complicated is that? And um, zero downtime deployment, basically meaning if I have a certain version of the application running and I want to deploy a new version, um, is there a possibility to have, have a transition that the end user would not notice that I have deployed something new? So basically in a way that like Amazon or Facebook does it all the time. So you refresh your browser and suddenly something has changed and you get some new content, but there's no obvious downtime or interruption of the application. Something which is also relevant in, in Spring Boot a lot is like external configuration. So how can I access my Spring Boot properties? How can I modify them? and change them during the runtime of the application. So I got roughly 45 minutes to, to do all that. I try to show most of the things live. I can't promise if I can show all of that, um, but let's see how that goes. So for those who have not raised their hands before, I want to ju just give a brief introduction about the two technologies. <laughs> so Cloud Foundry, I mean, if, if you consider Spring Boot as something that makes it easier to build a Spring application that takes a lot of stuff away from the developer and makes things easier. Basically, Cloud Foundry was initially thought of like an extension to that to make things also very easy on a, on a, on a platform perspective. And then um, still follow the 12-factor the application guidelines. So you can see there's a, a, a split between applications and services, and Cloud Foundry will treat those applications and services in a different way. So on the application side, uh, you're meant to deploy your hopefully stateless applications and all of the stateful services like the persistence and messaging and other legacy things will be handled as services. So once you deploy an application, um, the famous command is called CF push, that will basically send your application code to the platform. And basically after that, I should basically draw a line. So this is basically until here is what the developer really sees. Everything below here is what the platform does, and you don't necessarily see that. So Cloud Foundry will then come up with a so-called build pack, which is, can be considered like the runtime for that application. So in case of Spring Boot or Java, this would basically be a JRE. And bundle the, those two components together in a so-called droplet and build a container image out of this. And this container image will, can then be like easily started and scaled and so on. However, the end user is not going to be exposed to that container technology. So it uses containers on the inside, but it doesn't really expose it to the outside. Then in order to attach a service, there is a command called bind service. And then you, you basically create your service and you, you call that command. And that bind service command will, will then inject the properties, like for example, the JDBC or URL or the credentials into the application so the, 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 the developer does not have to configure that manually. In the end, the end user is going to get a route, like a URL, to, to access the application. 
Okay, so, I mean, this is pretty straightforward. Um, any questions to that? Good. I mean, you, you can, of course, always interrupt me, and, and if, if something is not clear, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go back a few steps and, and tell some more. Now, looking at Kubernetes, um, I kind of split this diagram in, into two steps, um, because most of you will know that you cannot deploy an application directly to a plain Kubernetes. So, as Kelsey Hightower, like the Mr. Developer Advocate of, of Google for Kubernetes says, like the entry ticket to your Kubernetes platform is a container. And that means you have to build a container before you can run your code on, um, on Kubernetes. So this can be done in, a, in an easy way, like in a, with a Docker file, where you specify, well, I have a base image, I have a runtime, and I have an application, and I want to wrap this all up into a container image, and that's what a Docker file will do. There are alternative options to do that. So if they're like Maven plugins that will you can attach to your build process in, in Spring Boot that would drop like a, a container image, or there's something from Google called Chip, which basically contains, creates container image based on uh, for Java code without the necessity to run like a local Docker daemon. Um, I'm not going to go into those. Uh, I just wanted to make you aware that this is not the only way to do that. Whatever what is necessary is that you come out with an image and you put that image into an image registry so Kubernetes can, can consume that later on. That brings us to Kubernetes, and this is always a bit more tricky to visualize because it consists of a lot of components. Now, I try to find an equivalent to the CF push command, which uh, is, can, is called like kubectl run. However, this command is deprecated. It's, it still works, but it's deprecated with the last version of the CLI. So I'm, I'm going to update that in the slides soon. Anyway, I, I will demo it this way, and it still makes sense to me to use it. What that this will do is it will do a lot of things. I'm going to start on the, on, the, on the low level. So the smallest deployable unit or handleable unit in Kubernetes is so-called pod. And this is coming from the animal world. Um, where it means like a pod can be like a group of whales. And you probably all are aware that this like Docker logo is that whale. So a, a pod basically means one to ma technically one to many whales. Now this um, definition will basically access that image registry where you pushed your image before, get the image and start a container instance of that. So potentially it can start more than one um, in image like containers in one pod, but that doesn't always make sense. So as I said, it's the smallest scalable unit, and if you scale a pod, then you scale all the instances in there. And this is something you should be aware when you start, because if you start like modeling and say, well, I have this like web application with like a front end, the back end, and a database, and I this pod kind of things make sense to me, and I want to group it all in there, it's not a good idea because then you basically scale your database too, um, which is not great. So in the end. I normally say if you have a clean stateless application, a one-to-one -one mapping of a, of a container to a pod makes, uh, makes the most sense. If there might be cases where two containers might sh want to share um, something on the underlying file system, then it's the time to do that. It, if you group them in a pod, Kubernetes will also make sure that all containers in the end will run on the same physical node of the cluster. So they will always be like co-located. Um, but if you have like a clean, loosely coupled microservice design, this shouldn't matter to you. So really, if you have the feeling that you want to group more containers in one pod, then you should probably question your design. Now, the next uh, important object is a so-called replica set. And as the name says, a replica set takes care of about the replication, basically the scaling of those pods. So this, this will basically, in the end, make sure the amount of instances are running that, um, that the configuration holds. And the deployment is that top-level object that can potentially co control multiple replica sets. So this becomes important if you want to roll out a new version of your application, um, either with a new con container image or with a new configuration, then it will uh, take care to start that new replica set, start a new pods, and make a smooth transition. So to finally expose the, um, the application to your end user, there are objects called services and a special object called ingress, which basically provides access to the, to, the, um, to the pods. By default, if you deploy a pod, nobody else can access it 
than the pod itself. The containers in within the pod, they can see each other, but no one else. And there are different levels of, of services. So you can either say this pod can be only visible to other pods in the cluster. This pod can be visible to like uh, somebody who has access to the node. Or this can be accessed by like a load balancer from the outside. And um, everybody can, can access that that has that IP. So, and in the end, you're going to get that endpoint and the user can finally access this. So what you can already see from those two pages is a tendency that we will have throughout of this talk. There is a lot more things, a lot more artifacts in Kubernetes that you can tweak and turn and configure. Um, this might be quite useful, but that in turn also brings along the necessity to understand what you're doing because it, will, it won't really guide you from setting up things wrong. Okay, so before I go into the demo, I mean, this is basically the technology stack that I'm trying to show. I have, I have a Spring Boot application, and I'll try to use the same code and, and run this on, um, on the Cloud Foundry side and in parallel on, like, on, a, on a Docker and Kubernetes side. So I hope all of this goes right, and the network's not going to let me down. Um, so just quickly, this is my application. In the end, I have a simple get mapping, which basically returns the instance ID of the application. This is basically the ID of the scaling instance within Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes. I use that to visualize to you um, if you're running multiple instances and a load balancer kicks in to basically switch between the applications. Then I added the setting to like get the profile. This is just like the, 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 the active profile. And um, so I'm going to change this, say, hola, Barcelona. So this is, was my part of the live coding today. So I've, I'm, I'm pr proud of myself. Um, and then I have an endpoint um, which just symbolizes a stupid programmer behavior. It triggers a system exit zero, which causes the, the JVM to shut down. So this is my mini, mini version of like chaos engineering. Um, so I think if Benjamin Wil Wilms from today would be here, he would not agree with that. But I should be enough to like symbolize um, what I want to do here. Now, I'm, I'm trying to run this side by side. Um, first of all, I've just changed the code. That means I have to rebuild that. This shouldn't take very long, and those things should be very fairly familiar with, with, with most of you, as this is like a spring conference. So, and now, I'm, I'm going to start with the on, the on the Cloud Foundry side and then try to th the thing in parallel with, with Kubernetes. So, um, on Cloud Foundry, you can use like CF push and then specify the, the, the char file or the application artifact that you want to, to, to push. Or you can like put this in a small YAML file where you say, okay, this is the, this the, 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 the char file that I have just built. And then I'm going to set some memory and amount of instances and give it a name. So all those are optional. They, Cloud Foundry would also generate them by, um, uh, by own algorithms. But in this case, I can be a bit sure that. Um, that this goes well, so I'm just going to check if I'm where I'm connected. I normally have multiple different environments, so this looks good. So then I say CF push, and it will, it will read that file and start uploading that code to the platform and basically identify the code, figure out at some point that this is a Java code. It will download the build packs and then start to create that, that container. That normally takes a minute or two. Um, so in the meantime, we can try to do something similar on, on the Kubernetes side. So as I said, I have, I have just compiled that code, so I have the char file. And um, so the next step for me would basically to build that container. So looking at that Docker file, this is basically what it, I mean, this could be different. It's just a sample. In the end, I'm using like an open JDK Alpine base image. Then I create some directory there. I copy the, the Java file in there. And I basically tell the, the advice docker. So once you start it, this is like the Java minus char is your command to run that container. 
Um, that means I'm going to build this. I'm going to give it a name like version 01. And then it's going to pull the code, run through that steps, and then I have my container image locally. So the next step would then be to push this to a uh, container registry. I have some of the commands already prepared in the cache, so that will save me some time. And if the network is not too slow, it's going to upload that. It's like network, the Wi-Fi seems to be friendly with me today. 20 meg is not that much. And then things should be up um, in my image registry. So I'm using Docker Hub as, as like a public repository. If you run Kubernetes locally in your environment, I would not recommend to push your productive images to Docker Hub. That would basically mean you have to set up an own um, image registry. So this one in the meantime has come up. Um, I called it simple web. And if I do like a curl on this simple web, Uh, EU, all right. Yeah, it's a European conference, eh? So, um, does it come back? Yes. So it's going to say this is my ID. The profile that I activated is dev because that's the default profile that I set, and it says Hola Barcelona. So if I, um, I can now put this into like a while loop. And then, yeah, it pings it continuously. So I, I have a very um, big screen resolution here, so I'm, I might change that a little bit. No, I can't. <coughs> so, not that one, sorry, I was pressing the wrong key. <laughs> okay, so this is basically doing its thing, and I'll try to split the screen um, and put a watch command in here. So I can say now, watch CF app simple web, and um, this should now tell me something that this app is running, so I'm also going to make this a little smaller. Is this still kind of readable well in the background? Oh, okay, I mean, I can't say come up to the front because the front is pretty much blocked already. Um, now, as I said, this is um, running and doing its thing. It should look a little different, though. Um, anyway, what I wanted to do, of course, is now play the Chaos Monkey and say, OK, um, this is the, the URL, and invoke that fail command. So now that means um, the application will crash. And it says, OK, it, 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 it can't resolve the request. I can also see here in a second or so, it refreshes every two seconds, that this um, application went down. It now went into starting mode again. And um, after a couple of seconds, like now, the application is coming back. So this is my basic one-on-one -on -one thing on a, on, a, on a cloud platform that I would basically expect. What else I, I can do that I said before, so I can also scale the application, um, call it three instances, and then the, um, it will spin up two new ones. So two new ones are starting. And as soon as the build pack will detect that the Java process come up, has come up successfully, it will put them into the load balancer. And you can see that now by basically by those alternating IDs that, um, that it balances the load between those applications. So that was two, two simple commands, not too difficult for me. And now I can also do like this um, curl command again <laughs> for it like to fail an application. And it, you will see now that this one is starting. So Cloud Foundry has detected that. And it, it immediately isolated this one from, from the load balancing mechanism. So the end, what the end user sees is that they would never realize that there is an outage. Um, I can do that, of course, again. And as this is so much fun, I can do it again. And maybe again. And sooner or later, uh, well, it's, it recovers quite quickly. Um, normally, it should, it should be possible to get it into a OK, now I have crashed it a couple of times. Um, and it might get angry with me, but still, you can see what this platform kind of provides as a res resilience mechanism um, to si such a failing component. Now, I want to try to reproduce the same thing in, in Kubernetes. So I also want to split my screen and show you something. So I'm going to say watch kubectl 
get, and now all the objects that I said, talked about before, deployment, replica set, pod, and services. So if I do this now, um, there's only a single like built-in service that Kubernetes provides itself. So this is nothing that comes from my side. And I have pushed the image now. So I can say kubectl run. And I say simple web with one replica to start with. I reference my image and I pass a um, environment variable to basically specify the active spring profile. So if I do that, it will tell me here it's deprecated, but I'm not going to care about this now. I want to care more on what's happening here. So as you can see, uh, a couple of things happened. So I've created a deployment object. Under that, I created a replica set, and it started with one pod, because I basically said, please do that with, um, with one instance. So if I um, want to try the same thing, I mean, this one, OK, no, I, this will not work yet. Mm, yeah, I forgot. What I need to do, of course, is, um, is expose this component as a service. So I'm going to say, use take this deployment simple web and expose this as a service of type load balancer. So this is like the um, exposing it via external IP and include a load balancer on that. And when I do that, I'm getting a bit of problems with my res resolution here. So I'm going to make this a little smaller. So this service has now just got created. And the external IP of that is, is localhost. So if I curl localhost now, it should basically come back with the same thing. So this is the same Spring Boot application now running inside a Docker container, inside of Kubernetes, and um, doing the same thing. So I will just repeat what I have done before to show you how this looks basically on the other side. I have, I have a problem with my Mac keyboard at the moment. So now this is not hello. I've used different versions of this application, as you can see from my uh, so this is working now, and it basically does it in a very similar way. So it pings it every second and checks if the application is, is behaving fine. So if I do the same thing here and say localhost and uh, fail, it will then kill the application. You can probably see this in a second right here, that it basically goes from a running into like a first completed and then again into a running state. and now. It comes back. So same thing, pretty much same timing. I mean, I should probably say I'm running <coughs> Kubernetes locally on a, a Docker for Mac instance, and the Cloud Foundry is public, so I'm not really comparing apples to apples here. But it's about the same, the similar response time. Now, if I if I want to scale in Kubernetes, um, I can. This would be the command to say I want so many replicas and the deployment of simple web. And now I get two additional pods. So it kind of creates the containers. And now you can see a couple of things on this side. So even though I had a healthy instance running and I scaled two more instances, my end user will see an outage. And um, this is by kind of very fundamental to the understanding between application and containers. It's like Kubernetes is basically only aware um, about if a container is running or not. So when it starts the container and the process of the container is there, then the load balancer by default will route the traffic to that container. But at that point, the Spring Boot application within the container is not ready yet. So this is something that you need to configure additionally. Um, I have prepared that. It I just need to get some, <coughs> some better. So I have I have a cheat sheet because um, I'm not YAML safe all the time, um, and this component is called the readiness probe, as you can see here, um, which you have to add to your um, Kubernetes configurate. Oh come on! So I'm gonna take this out and then to edit a deployment or basically any module in Kubernetes, you can just basically type kubectl edit and then deployment simple web, and that basically brings you to that YAML notation of the overall configuration. And if you are a, a fan of YAML, then Kubernetes is definitely the right place for you, so there's a lot. 
And um, so this is the specification that we deployed before. So you can see here there's like the active spring profile with the value of def. This is my image and so on. And right now I'm just going to edit this readiness probe into it. The only thing I should change is that endpoint because it's not called hello. It's just called it's the, the, the base level. So, and what will happen now? I need to be quick. So, no, go away. Um, it created a new replica set because I have changed the configuration. And what it's going to do now, it's going to start the new part in a new replica set. And once this is healthy, it will take down the old one. You so you can see now it's running, but it's not ready. So the container is there, but the Spring Boot application is not. And only once this will come up successfully and Kubernetes is able to ping the, point, uh, the endpoint, then it's going to start taking down the other ones. So. Um, this is something what the Cloud Foundry build pack will provide you out of the box. In Kubernetes, you have to configure it manually. Still, I mean, you're going to ach achieve the same thing. Um, I need to have a look on the time here. Now. I guess I've got a bit of time left. Right, so we've, we've done that. And um, now, another thing that I wanted to show quickly is, is the logging of that. So in Cloud Foundry, it's like, CF, logs, and then the name of the application. And it has a built-in logging aggregator. So what you're basically going to see here is the, the ongoing log of all the applications. And in here, you can basically, if you read it somewhat correctly, see, you see the instance ID and things as well, because it's constantly pinged. Um, but it, it will continuously log and aggregate the logs over all the instance of a certain application type. Now, on Kubernetes side, lo the logging works in, in a similar way. You have kubectl logs. But in this case, you need to specify the ID of the pod. So you have to identify the, the pod ID, and, and only then you can do like a continuous log. So now it's basically, this, this is like the end of the, of the, um, of the Spring Boot boot process. So it's, it's standing right there, not doing, uh, nothing, not doing anything else. One of the things that I don't like, I mean, uh, first of all, it's kind of cumbersome that I have to pick out the the pod ID. The other thing is I could basically log. It gives me the option to log on a level of labels. So I'm not going to go very deep into labels, but this one has a label um, run simple web. So if I do that, it will basically collect the logs over all three of the, or basically over all of the deployed instances. But for some reason that I have never figured out why, I can't let this one run continuously. So I can either label or run the logs continuously. Um, that means if you want to do achieve the same thing, you have, as in Cloud Foundry, you probably have to, to take an additional tooling to do that. So, um, what else did I want to show? Um, yeah, patching. Now, now we've discovered this, um, that we have a code which is kind of buggy. Fortunately, we have two stable platforms that provide resilience to cope with that. In the end, I mean, if it's not only me, pinging that point like on a curl command, but there's usually going on to that. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be like that. So I'm going to update my code. So this is part two of my live coding. And I'm going to specify this like a new version of the application now. And I'm going to take this bad call out. So that's that. And then I'm probably going to need a new window. I'm going to build a new, a new char file. So this has basically the, the patched code now. Yes, this is good, looks fine. I mean, it doesn't, of course, pick it up automatically. Um, but there are commands to, to deal with that. Now, in Cloud Foundry, the, uh, on a naked Cloud Foundry, you would have to apply a manual blue-green deployment. So you basically push the new code. And once this is tested and running fine, you switch like the route to the, to the new application, and you have a smooth transition then. There are command line plugins, one that I'm using here now, which is called Blue Green Deploy, which does that automatically for you. So in the end, it will, I'm going to also show this here. Um, it will create a new application and call this simple web new and then basically wait until this application is up and ready 
um, in order to, um, to start using it. And now once it's there, and um, well, this request to say is not entirely correct because this one is still working and this report's already started. So it's a little bit too optimistic, but I'm very confident that it's going to make it in the end. So once this app will become ready, This always the seconds that feels like hours on a live presentation. I <laughs> guess most of you have seen that before. I'm, 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 I should have probably scaled it down to one, but it's not still going to work. So um, now the new one is there, and now it's going to do that switch and changing that routes and um, add the old route to the new application. And at one point, it will just come back with the version two. So it takes the old instances out. If if I have only one instance, it's more impressive because then you have like a, a switch from one HTTP call to the next one. The bottom line is your end user is never going to notice. So this is the way how you can basically patch application code, still maintain old rest points to be, to be alive. And if I had not added that version 2, I don't think anybody would have, would, have, would have really seen this. So and if I do like to prove that, so if I invoke that fail command, it says now fixed. So this code has been patched, and um, it's not um, the application is not vulnerable anymore. Now, on Kubernetes side, you might guess it. We're going to do the similar thing. So the first thing we're going to do is build a new container image. And the next one will be to, to push that image. So. Ten more minutes. That's that should should be working. <laughs> I'm gonna take a photo in the meantime. I've never seen. I've never had such a big crowd where people like, were sitting on the floor. I'm, I'm I'm really. I need to send this to my manager. So anyway, raise your hands real quick. And if you find that cool, okay, awesome. Thank you very much. This is. I'm gonna have a very happy evening today. Um, now, okay, this is done. We, we can go back to this. So in here, we have to do the, the similar thing as before and say kubectl edit deployment uh, simple web. And so now what I have to do is basically update the name of that image. So I've, up, I've changed this from version 01 to 02. And I'll just demonstrate to you if I could like, do a stupid typo or something like that. Not the behavior of the robustness of Kubernetes. So I'll basically submit an image that it will not be able to find. And then it creates a new replica set, but it comes with a point that says it can't pull that image. So it doesn't switch to the broken image. It leaves the old one running until this will be resolved. So it that it's, it's kind of intelligent there that it doesn't really um, switch to something which it already knows will be broken. Um, in the end, if I do this now, um, so now I get an additional replica set, so we have plenty of replica sets now. You can remove them from time to time um, if, if you know they are um, not relevant anymore. And here you can see the same thing. So now it has switched. As we have three instances, it's still the load band, so it has to take the other ones down. Um, but the refresh also works here, and the, the new version comes in, in in a very smooth transition. So this is mostly it from the from the live demo side to like go back to the presentation. And I hope you all this was kind of new to some of you, to other people not really so much in the platform space. So I've seen people coming from Cloud Foundry and going to Kubernetes and vice versa. And so the thing that you can see is like, of, if, of course, in Kubernetes, you can configure a lot more, but you also need to know more in order to prevent you from doing things wrong. Now, if you come from Kubernetes, it looks like, well, this is very simple, but can it do everything that I want to do? And so I've listed a couple of things that I really like. So especially that live editing in, in Kubernetes of the config with the built-in zero downtime deployment is really a lot of fun. So that, that's, that seems to be very well thought through and um, uh, easily usable. It has a large functional scope. I pretty much only scratched the surface, um, given the time. Um, 
and has very granular uh, patterns there. So you have different levels of service exposure. This is what I would actually say from a container scheduling perspective is quite an advantage over Cloud Foundry. If I can say, well, this one is only visible to others, but not to the outside. It's also very good like, for security purposes. And um, the, the core of Kubernetes is very robust and resilient. I mean, this is coming out of Google, uh, was their internal system. And uh, of course, high popularity. I mean, if you look at the CNCF ecosystem, there are thousands of products, a big, biggest OS, OSS community, and it's pretty much available everywhere, even on Amazon. So um, it's uh, definitely something that we have to consider. Now, on the downsides, and we've seen that a lot in, in our projects, especially um, when, we, when we migrated from Cloud Foundry, that we, it suddenly became visible developers will need an additional level of skill to properly handle containers. I mean, this is not so difficult, but to properly handle Kubernetes because it's, it's easy to do things wrong and it, it takes about time to find out that things are wrong. And the, the, real, the biggest difference really is that container handling. I mean, this was pretty straightforward in my demo now, um, like build a container and push the container. In reality, you have to do the same thing, but you also have to maintain them. So if a container has a vulnerability, you need to patch it. Um, in Cloud Foundry, this will be done under the cover by the, uh, when they exchange the base image. And also, you have to maintain that registry, which will become a new single point of failure. We had one project where we had the container registry with a certif certificate issue for a couple of weeks. So. You, nothing's going to happen then because you can't deploy if you don't have your images. So um, this is something you should know. The aggregated logging today was basically just symbolizing that it has a good core, but it often requires more to do. So if you do Kubernetes, you would probably very soon do like Helm for packaging, Istio, Prometheus, and, and a lot of things to attach to your system. And that means additional maintenance of your, of your cluster infrastructure. Um, on the Cloud Foundry side, the simple part is really, it is very simple. Um, also, it has that feeling of being containerless. So, I mean, serverless is a very popular term nowadays. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of the technology, but not of the term, because it kind of, if it means you don't have to worry about your server and your infrastructure, then it means in Cloud Foundry you don't have to worry about containers. It's, they're there, they'll be used, they will be used, but you don't have to interact with them. And in terms of developer productivity, you have a really fast application to, to platform path. And it's very mature. So um, it's been around a lot longer than, than Kubernetes is. And um, it, it, it just works. So it has reduced configuration possibili <laughs> sorry, possibilities on the downside. The blue-green deployment and automatic patching is not, I mean, it has the same functionality, but it's, it doesn't seem to be as built in as it is in Kubernetes. Um, the problem is, it's kind of boring. I mean, last year I visited both KubeCons, or like two KubeCons and two Cloud Foundry summits. And as this has, there's not nothing new anymore. It's more like custom adoption stories, but it's not so like new features here and there and new pro new things in the ecosystem. It it, it, it it's there and it and it's set. Whereas in on the on the KubeCon, I don't know if anyone of you been there. The next one is happening next week, also here in Barcelona. It's like very enthusiastic crowd around. Sorry for that. Crowd around that, and um, everybody is presenting their YAML files and what they all did with it. So it's a lot of things going to happen there. Yeah, for me it was always. Oh no, one quote I wanted to bring in from from Kelsey Hightower, and he's like the number one advocate for Kubernetes. It's saying it's like it's an infrastructure framework. It's YAML based, um, but for from a developer perspective. It's far away from the productivity you can find in parts of fast platforms, and I and I can only like uh, second on that. This this is what was my experience as well. So, in the past, this was always my my last slide where I said like I would like to have a platform which has the simplicity of Cloud Foundry, and and the functional scope of Kubernetes. Now, this is something that has started growing in the Cloud Foundry community. They have various options for dealing with Kubernetes. I mean, the first one was the Cloud Foundry container runtime, which is a Kubernetes, full-blown Kubernetes, and then you run it side by side. The like pivotal container service is like a commercial implementation of that. Then there's Quarks, which used to be CF containerization, which runs Cloud Foundry in containers provided by Kubernetes. So that means you already have both platforms 
in inside of each other. And uh, the most interesting one is the so-called the Project Irene, because uh, as you might have guessed, Cloud Foundry, as it existed prior to Kubernetes, already had an internal container scheduler. Otherwise, all that functionality would not be possible. Now, with Irene, the idea is to make this pluggable. So the, the internal name of the Cloud Foundry scheduler is called Diego, and the container format is called Garden. This was also there prior to Docker. And now the idea is just like to make this configurable. So you can say, I would rather use Kubernetes as the container engine and use Cloud Foundry as a top-level API. So um, this is, and I don't expect anybody to know and understand that, the architectural diagram of, of Cloud Foundry inside. And you see like the, the big portion here is that Diego cell, which runs all those little containers where the workload is in. And the, I, the idea for that is just like to use Kubernetes for exactly that. And then this project Irene builds like a layer. And so from an from a developer side, you have the same API, but then you go against a Kubernetes cluster. And that means you can also access it in that way and interact with it through Kubernetes API or Cloud Foundry API. So this is fairly new. It was demoed live on the CF Summit a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, for next year, I plan to bring a demo here. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm running out of time. Two more minutes. Um, Again, if you want to reproduce that, I have this code repository here on my GitHub account with all the instruction steps if you want to get your hands onto that and play with it by yourself. For all the people in Southern Germany, yes, this is again the hint for the Cloud Foundry meetup. We definitely don't only talk about Cloud Foundry all the time because like, it's CF push and bind service, so it doesn't really require a meetup to talk about that all the time. Um, and then this is, this is uh, my Twitter handle. If you Quick advertisement, this is my colleague, Andreas. He is currently running a security workshop in another room. He's going to have a session on Spring Cloud on Kubernetes tomorrow, I think, at 6 in the auditorium. So um, this is a more advanced level for what I started today as, a, as an introduction. And um, yeah, feel free to stop by. And game over. I see that. OK. <laughs> well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>